School of Urban Studies and Planning. And along with my colleagues, Chris Monsier uh, from Civil and Environmental Engineering, who is there. And normally, Robert Bertini, who's also from uh, Civil Engineering and Urban Studies and Planning, who is not attending, perhaps, today? No, he's in New York. He's in New York. Um, we were all in Washington, D.C. earlier this week at the Transportation Research Board Conference and um, have all come back and not quite, though. Uh, so the three of us co-organized this weekly seminar. We welcome all of you. Um, a couple other announcements. We do broadcast the seminar on the web, both live and then we archive it uh, for future viewing. And it is for that reason that if you ask a question, we like you to use these microphones that are, I think, at about all of the tables, except where I'm sitting, of course. And what you need to do is press where it says touch and keep holding it while the red light should be on while you're asking your question. So that way, people watching us on the web, and people do watch us on the web, uh, so they can hear your question, and then they'll hear um, Tom's answer. So please remember to do that. And without further ado, I am going to introduce today's speaker, who is our own Tom Kimple, who is a graduate of the uh, PhD program here in Urban Studies. And since then, he's been working as a researcher um, in our Center for Urban Studies. And today, he's going to be talking about some of the automated passenger uh, count uh, system and its use on uh, TriMet's light rail. Thank you, Jennifer. My name's uh, Tom Kimple, and I'm a research associate with the Center for Urban Studies. Uh, today's topic is automated passenger counts on light rail. Um, in particular, we're interested in uh, validation, sampling, uh, and reporting at TriMet. Uh, this presentation is essentially, the majority of it is uh, from the presentation I gave at the Transportation Research Board in Washington, D.C. on Monday. And then I went in and I added some uh, contextual information uh, regarding the history of light rail, I'm sorry, regarding the history of APC technology at TriMet um, since the uh, mid-80s. And most of that material came from um, Transit Cooperative Research Program Report H28, which uh, Jim Strathman did along with um, Peter Firth, uh, Hemily, and um, uh, Mueller. So um, if anybody's interested, um, and a detailed um, history, uh, that report, uh, Appendix A in particular, could provide um, additional information. Um, essentially, the research that I presented at uh, the Transportation Research Board, we're interested in automatic passenger counter accuracy, um, and in particular evaluation of the, the counts that are generated um, by the sensors on TriMet's light rail lines. Um, we're interested in designing a sampling methodology to satisfy national transit database reporting, as well as internal monthly ridership reporting uh, within the agency. And so as far as the context is concerned, um, we've, we've seen a, a rapid increase in the number of operational automatic passenger counter systems um, since 1995. We've seen an increase of 445 percent, and that's from a base of um, 60 in 1995. Um, what's occurring over time is uh, automatic passenger counters are becoming more mechanically reliable uh, and accurate, and so we're starting to see um, uh, third or fourth generation uh, technology um, in these various units. And we're also seeing improved locational referencing of the passenger counts um, due to the integration of um, automatic vehicle location technologies. And so essentially what we have today are since a lot of transit agencies are implementing this technology, is um, we're beginning to see a transition um, towards ridership reporting using automatically collected data uh, via sensors. Um, and this is a shift from the traditional way of collecting uh, passenger activity information, which is onboard uh, surveys, where we send out uh, ride checkers um, to count the number of people getting on and off um, uh, trips, uh, essentially. And um, the the thing to note about onboard surveys is um, they're particularly um, expensive because it requires a lot of um, manpower. Um, the other way to uh, estimate ridership uh, typically involves uh, revenue-based estimation, and that is actually, um, while fairly good, um, there's uh, difficulties with estimating ridership using revenue-based methods, um, primarily if you think about um, all the special fair payment programs for like seniors and teenagers and employer passes. It's like you just can't use um, fare box data explicitly 
um, to estimate ridership. And so essentially as it stands, um, even though this technology um, is, uh, has appeared and is increasing over time, um, few transit agencies have approved national transit database um, sampling plans uh, based on uh, the used data that's been automatically collected. So uh, what is the National Transit Database? Um, it's essentially the Federal Transit Administration's primary national database for statistics on the, the, the industry. Um, over 600 agencies are required to file annual reports, and the goal is to collect um, uniform statistics. So you compare um, uh, various measures across transit properties. Um, this information is used by the uh, administrators uh, within the FTA to apportion uh, over $4 billion worth of funds um, to the various agencies. And so if you're a, uh, an area where uh, a metropolitan region where uh, transit uh, use is increasing, the number of vehicles um, and the fleet is increasing, uh, one is likely to receive more funding than an area in decline. Um, in particular, <laughs> um, the study, we're kind of interested in two variables, and I'll define them here in a minute. Uh, the first is uh, unlinked passenger trips. And the second is passenger miles of service, and these show up in Table 19 of the uh, National Transit Database under um, service supplied um, and consumed. Um, some quick definitions. Um, I know there's a lot of pros um, in the room uh, who know uh, what all these terms mean, but for those who are um, less knowledgeable, um, uh, a trip is essentially a one-way path um, from an origin to destination. So this morning I got on Route 14, and I went from... Uh, essentially 16 in Hawthorne to 5th uh, and Salmon. Um, so that's my trip. The overall trip would essentially be for Route 14. It goes from North Terminal, uh, where there's a layover uh, down in the Pearl District, uh, or River District, um, to 94th and Foster, so one-way directional uh, movement. Um, a block is an ordered sequence of trips, and so um, the best way to describe this is um, I essentially have a vehicle that's going to operate many trips um, throughout the day, and they're going to be staggered. So if I'm a vehicle, I might operate the 1010, uh, but not the, the trip 1020, 1030, 1040, but I might operate the 1050 uh, and so forth. So it's an uh, ordered sequence of trips. Um, a train, uh, in this context, since we're focusing on rail, uh, one or more vehicles operating as a single entity, so I can have essentially a one- or two-car um, train. Uh, boarding is simply a passenger that gets on. Uh, lighting is a passenger that gets off. Um, headway is the spacing and time between successive vehicles. And so if I have uh, essentially uh, four buses per hour on my route, my headway is 15 minutes. Uh, time point is a specific location where vehicles are scheduled to depart at a certain time. And so TriMet officially writes schedules to um, time points. Uh, there's essentially... I'd say anywhere from six to a dozen stops um, between time points. And so what you see online um, when you're doing, uh, uh, when you're looking at the next bus arrival is um, a lot of those times are interpolated uh, based on speed and distance from um, a time point reading. Um, two variables we're interested in are unlinked passenger trips, uh, which is a system level measure is the number of passengers who board transit vehicles. Um, these are essentially boardings. And the reason we use this as opposed to linked passenger trips is uh, it's far easier um, to collect the data on boardings than it is um, on a linked passenger trip. And so a person who transfers once uh, would essentially count as two unlinked passenger trips. If my um, travel required two transfers, uh, I would essentially be counted three times. And then passenger miles of service is the cumulative sum of the distances ridden by each passenger. And so for me this morning, my you know, passenger miles um, that I represent would be about a mile and a half. So. And that's summed up over um, all the riders. And so why do we need accurate passenger counts? It's very relevant for service planning. And so if we think about route design, um, there might be uh, like a route extension. Um, in the case of uh, light rail, oftentimes the uh, bus service is changed to uh, feeder service when a new light rail line goes in. Um, accurate passenger counts are also relevant for bus stop consolidation and relocation. And so there's the uh, Streamline project, of which this is a component. Um, Ahmed El Ghanedi's PhD dissertation is uh, explicitly looking at this issue. And the argument um, in this case is um, if we're going to eliminate or relocate stops, we would like to do so um, where the agency can essentially save money um, by providing service to fewer stops, but at the same time we need to know what the demand is and that we would like um, the passengers 
who take the bus currently to not be uh, too adversely affected due to a removal or a relocation of their bus stop. Um, it's also relevant to uh, stop amenities, so why put shelters, uh, signage, and various other things at stops that have few riders? It doesn't make sense. Um, scheduling is uh, important. Um, in particular, um, off-peak period headways are driven by um, policy. So the policy might be we're going to operate 15-minute service in the uh, midday time period. Uh, for uh, peak periods, they're load-driven. And so they're kind of based on um, essentially the capacity of the vehicle um, and uh, 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 service standard based on what the uh, desirable uh, maximum load is. And um, uh, it's also relevant for transfers. And so with respect to performance monitoring, where I believe TriMet excels, um, and I, I should probably jump in a little bit. It's like a lot of transit agencies have automatic passenger counters. They have automatic vehicle location systems. Um, few have been as successful as TriMet um, with respect to the integration of these two technologies. And a lot of agencies are collecting data, and it's just sitting in a database. And uh, the analysis of the data, once it's been collected, um, how do I describe it? You can collect data via advanced technologies for a number of reasons. A lot of trans agencies think that the, the best thing to do with this data is to simply use it to provide better information to the customers. So for example, I want to let my customers know when their vehicle is going to arrive. Now, another use of the data is simply how can we look at essentially archive data that's been collected um, for, say, like real-time operations. We store it in a database, we save it, and we go in after the fact, we analyze it. How can we use this sort of offline data analysis to improve internal decision-making? And I believe that that's where TriMet um, really excels compared to uh, what I see um, uh, with other transit properties. Um, there's an annual passenger census. Now, how do I describe this? It's annual. It used to be conducted every five years at the cost of, um, I want to say, $300,000. Um, due to the abundance of data, it's now um, undertaken annually. Uh, these are at two levels. One is the level of individual stops, so you can have multiple routes serving one stop, or uh, at the route stop level where it's uh, each single route um, by each stop um, on the route, uh, National Transit Database Reporting, um, which we're going to talk a little bit uh, more about today. Um, and then other internal performance reports. And so um, we'll get into it here in a little bit, but the rail automatic passenger count technology is fairly new um, at TriMet. They have an extensive history of bus um, automatic passenger technology use. Um, the internal performance reports, um, if anybody would like additional information on the types of reports that are being generated within the agency, um, there was a, a report done by me under the Great Cities Universities um, Consortium project, and it should be available on the PSU um, ITS Lab um, website, but there's probably 25 or 30 slides um, detailing uh, the various types of uh, performance reports that are done internally at TriMet. Um, interestingly enough, uh, <laughs> there's no real-time APC counts. And so this is due to two reasons. So why a real-time APC count would be relevant would essentially be, um, so like I'm a field supervisor and I have two bunch buses um, and I would like to know that if I'm going to tell the following bus to pass its leader, I would like to know that that bus is empty, which it probably should be according to theory, but it's impossible. Um, for the field supervisor to have information of how many people are on that bus um, except for uh, radio contact um, with the operator. And so the two key issues on why there's no real-time APC counts at any agency simply has to do with bandwidth issues, that we're transmitting this data over the radio, um, and the amount of data that can be transmitted is fairly limited. Um, the other issue deals with uh, essentially the accuracy um, of the raw counts and how reliable um, those are. Um, Quick stats, <laughs> TriMet light rail system properties, uh, essentially three lines uh, with, a, with a green line um, forthcoming uh, as it presently stands, uh, 44 miles of uh, track and 65 stops, and uh, rail carries a little over a quarter of total weekday ridership. Um, this came from Appendix A of TCRP Report H28 that Jim Strathman put together uh, via uh, personal interviews. 
Um, the initial experimentation with APC technology in TriMet um, dates to um, the early 80s, and the technology was found promising. I was looking at some documents yesterday, and uh, OC Transpo in Ottawa, Ontario, um, started playing around with APCs in uh, 1975, and I was kind of, it actually makes perfect sense now that I think about it, but um, the original data collected by these units in 1975 was transferred <laughs> off the bus via um, cassette tape, <laughs> and that was the uh, data storage um, mechanism. Ten units were installed on the fleet um, by 1982, and uh, essentially plagued by problems, so um, the APC program had uh, difficulty uh, getting off um, the ground. Um, the majority of the data was not usable, um, less than 20%. This could be due to um, equipment malfunctions, inaccurate counts, um, poor locational referencing capabilities. And so you think about it, this sort of predates GPS. So how are you going to assign passenger demand to a bus stop without GPS? Well, one has to do it essentially via um, time clocks and uh, odometer readings. It can be done, but it, but it introduces um, uh, degree of uh, inaccuracy, and then we have trip assignment issues as well. Um, the lean years, I think, is important. Um, at numerous national conferences, I always hear about how expensive APC units are, and what's really interesting about um, the TriMet uh, case study is that um, APCs, uh, the commitment was made to force them to work um, during uh, times of budget cuts, and so in 1984, um, they essentially laid off um, all the ride checkers, and uh, NTD reporting was contracted out. And so in the mid-'80s, we begin to see some improvements. We're getting better data retention rates, um, better at locational referencing. Uh, we begin to see the first um, uh, applications being developed um, using counts generated from um, uh, the technology, um, in particular the interactive schedule maintenance program and the schedule writer's analysis package. Um, so by 1986, we essentially had 50 buses um, equipped with APC units, which represents about 10% uh, of the fleet. Uh, although we still have issues, um, we still have uh, spatial accuracy issues. And so um, essentially, um, without automatic vehicle location, uh, we essentially have observations for passenger activity that are valid at the trip and time point level. But if we think about where transit demand is realized, it's at the level of the uh, individual bus stop. And there's continued um, uncertainty uh, about the quality of the data, and in particular, um, the question of whether we can use this data for national transit database reporting. And so, again, the idea is, is to automate, to use automated data um, for national transit database reporting, saving um, the need to uh, send uh, uh, ride checkers out in the field. And again, it's a, it's a cost issue. Um, but at the time, we're essentially having uh, missed trip assignments. Um, again, low data recovery rates and um, accuracy issues. And so um, I have to say this is the first study, Strathman and Hopper, 1993, where we specifically looked at um, uh, advanced technologies at TriMet, and it sort of provided um, the early basis for the uh, PSU-TriMet research relationship. Um, the modern era um, is related to the uh, upgrade of the uh, bus dispatch system, which became fully operational in uh, 1998. And the key components here are bus stop level automatic vehicle location, uh, which is GPS-based, and uh, we have uh, onboard data storage, which allows for the archiving of um, operations data. Our data retention rates um, presently are pretty good. I'd say they're in the 60 um, to 70 percent range. Some of the people here from TriMet can correct me um, if I'm wrong there. Um, and uh, this is an absolutely amazing statistic. Um, APCs, I believe, are deployed on approximately 72 or 73 percent of the fleet at present. So all new vehicle purchases um, have this technology. And again, one of the arguments is, well, don't they cost a lot? Well, over time, as with most technology, um, uh, uh, prices uh, decrease. Um, so I believe it's about an extra thousand to fifteen hundred dollars to install um, APCs on each bus. And so if you think about the, uh, the capital cost of a new bus. Um, it's extremely uh, minor. Um, so now we're going to shift a little bit towards uh, light rail APC technology uh, at the agency. Um, I would argue <laughs> that the overall positive experience with the bus APC program, particularly in the uh, area of applications, um, has provided much of the impetus for the uh, rail APC program. <laughs> and so uh, uh, at the time we undertook our study, uh, which
which was last year, uh, 18 and 95 vehicles uh, were APC equipped, 19% uh, um, coverage essentially of all the rail vehicles. And then by the end of 2005, um, there'll be 10 new vehicles, which will bring that up to 26%, and the long-term goal is going to be 100%. And um, why the fleet penetration rate is important is, um, I'll talk a little bit more about it later on in the study, but if you think about it, it's like, if I'm going to generate passenger counts and I want all of my, say, bus trips represented or all of my stops or um, all of my routes, um, if I have a limited fleet deployment of this technology, I'm going to have to be... Um, on top of things, and I'm going to have to come up with a coordinated approach um, for collecting data. And so when the uh, fleet penetration rates are high enough, um, one can essentially let the vehicles travel um, and just let them collect data. So it requires less management. Um, and then for this study, I should point out, um, essentially what we're looking at with light rail is these are all two-car trains except for the uh, Red Line uh, Airport Max, which is a single-car um, train. And then uh, since uh, APC deployment is so low, um, the agency is essentially saying, well, don't hook up two cars that both have APCs. Try to leave it as one with or one out in, in the case of uh, two-car trains. Um, with respect to the actual technology, um, it's a German company, Iris, um, and the actual sensors and the product is the uh, infrared motion analyzer. Um, these are third-generation units, I believe, uh, the fourth-generation um, are out at this point. Um, these utilize both passive and active counting technologies, and so the passive component, um, essentially what the passive component does is it registers a change in heat radiation sort of from the ambient surroundings. So if we think about it, it's like the floor is cold. And if I sort of break the curtain uh, these, uh, of, this, of these sensors, um, essentially I'm of a much higher heat, and it's going to register uh, that difference in heat. And then the active counting technology component is essentially the sensor is going to transmit an infrared beam and it's going to bounce off people, packages, or whatever and uh, be received uh, by the sensor as well. And so it essentially by integrating both passive and active technology you essentially make up for the shortcomings of each if they were uh, sort of stand alone. Um, the two key components are the sensors and of course uh, the analyzer uh, which is connected to the onboard computer and then uh, the actual counts are determined versus uh, uh, via statistical algorithms, uh, form of pattern analysis, um, and this is done at the level of the uh, individual bus stop. Uh, here's a quick diagram off the website of um, Iris's website. Um, essentially, we have an open door, um, two sensors over this door. Um, there's a switch, sort of door open, door close, no one but stop and start counting. Um, the analyzer is essentially where um, the logic uh, is located, and uh, the analyzer is connected to the onboard computer. And so here's a more detailed picture down here of the analyzer, and then these are the various sensors. And again, each sensor has both an active um, and a passive um, component. Okay, so rail versus bus. We did a study in 1993 looking at um, APC accuracy on buses, so why do it on rail? <laughs> well, the main difference is, is the vehicles are different, <laughs> and the key difference is with bus, essentially one person can board or light um, at any given time due to narrow door widths. Um, for rails, the doors are much wider, and you can have simultaneous um, passenger movements, both boardings and alightings as people are shuffling um, to get on and off. Um, the rail vehicles. And so essentially we have greater complexity on rail, and so what we're thinking is that we have a much greater complexity um, for counting errors. And so for a number of doors um, on bus, we only need APC units on two doors, uh, front and rear on one side of the vehicle. Um, for rail, uh, each door uh, has a sensor, uh, three on each side, and a maximum of uh, three per stop, since you can only border a light from one side of the train. Um, the previous study we did um, looking at the accuracy of the counts from the automatic passenger counters, um, we essentially need to establish a baseline. So what is ground truth? And so we used um, video camera recordings. And the argument on why that was good was actually David Griffin, who's lo no longer with TriMet. Um, the argument why that is good is um, that in case, I mean, there's always a certain degree of measurement error that can happen when you're using human counters. Um, especially multiple 
counters. So everybody has a different kind of, um, uh, how do I describe it, uh, a different uh, skill set with respect to being able to count uh, dynamic passenger movements. Um, what we were thinking at the time of the bus study with cameras was um, that in cases of ambiguity, like was that um, five alightings or six? It's like you could replay the video and double check and make sure you're getting it right. Um, for the present study on rail, um, we used a single ride checker, which was uh, Steve Callis, who went out and collected data. Um, and we initially sought to use cameras, but there were various alignment issues, and uh, there wasn't a direct view um, from the cameras uh, towards the doors. And so essentially what we have is, from two previous studies we've looked at that involved manual data collection, we did find measurement error, and so there's likely to be a little bit in this study due to the fact that um, we're using uh, ride checkers versus um, video cameras. Um, to establish the baseline. Um, however, uh, we feel pretty good that, one, it was Steve. <laughs> Steve's a smart guy and knows what he's doing, and so I have complete confidence that, uh, that he's going to do it right. And then the second is, since we're just using one person to count, um, we're going to minimize uh, measurement error as well. Um, this is from the bus report. Um, ideally, with respect to passenger counts, the thing we want to know is, are the counters counting what we think they are? Seems like a pretty simple... Um, research question. Um, essentially, <laughs> uh, we're interested in accuracy and precision. And so over here in the first box, box A, we have a case of low accuracy and low precision. And so if we go over here, over on the right, uh, under item A, we can essentially see that if we take a sample uh, from the data, if error represents um, the difference between the true population mean, which is here. So this is what happens in reality. And this is the mean of the passenger activity variable that we get from our sample. Um, accuracy is related to the distance between the true population value and the sample value. And precision uh, is concerned with the uh, width of the distribution. And so this would be the width right here, from here to here. And so the narrower the width, um, the better the precision. And so ultimately what we would like to see is that um, we would like to see a case of high precision and high accuracy. So the sample mean is very close to the population mean, and the width of our distribution um, is narrow. So accuracy for the rail study is defined as the systematic difference between passenger boardings and alighting counts recorded by APC units versus the same counts reported by a ride checker. Um, and I just mentioned what um, precision was. And so if we think about theory, <laughs> what we think is that this is prior to undertaking the study is that there would be um, Errors would likely exist, errors in accuracy, due to uh, the sensors either being positioned on inside doors or outside doors. And the, the argument on why there might be discrepancies is they're mounted, the sensors are mounted in different locations. And so on the corners of the vehicles, they're all at the same height and the same position um, in front of the doors. Um, the ones on the interior doors are mounted slightly different. Okay, And so that's a likely to be a source of error. Um, high volume doors versus low volume doors. And so we defined a high volume door as five or more uh, essentially simultaneous passenger movements. So five or more ons or offs um, per stop per door. And if that was the case, then we flagged it as a high volume door. Low volume is anything less. Um, these two here we put in the study, although if you think about it, if the counters are uh, working correctly due to the fact that the passive component um, of the sensors um, and the passing component is going to uh, measure changes in heat radiation that if I'm carrying um, luggage onto a light rail car, it's going to be largely my luggage at the same temperature um, as the surroundings, unlike me, who's actually going to register uh, more heat. And we also thought there might be front versus rear car differences in the way that passengers jockey for position um, on the loading platforms. And so passengers kind of sort themselves out, thinking, uh, you know, more towards the front of the bus versus uh, more towards the rear. I'm sorry, not bus, but uh, first train compared to the second train. Um, so data collection for the rail APC accuracy component of the study, uh, random selection of bus trips. Um, we looked at midday and evening peak period trip segments, um, APC equipped vehicles only, and we only looked at so an observation essentially represents um, some kind of passenger movement in the door. And so if there was zero passenger activity as a door, we weren't interested in it. Okay? So uh, we ended up with 722 observations um, over a five-week period early last year. Um, we undertook a paired 
sample statistical uh, tests uh, based on t-tests, and these are uh, dependent samples. And so here's a table of um, descriptive statistics <laughs> and essentially the uh, mean differences. Um, again, we have 722 observations. Um, over all of the observations, uh, we have a mean number of boardings per door of uh, 1.59 as recorded by the APCs, and we can see that there's a discrepancy between what was recorded um, by Steve, who's showing um, slightly higher uh, boardings per door based on his observations. And in the case of the lightings, uh, that's essentially reversed. We're seeing slightly higher counts generated by the automatic passenger counters versus what was recorded um, by the observer. And so these values over here on the right-hand two columns are the mean difference between boardings and lightings, and those with a uh, little asterisk or um, the differences prove statistically significant at the 95% uh, level of confidence, which essentially means that we have error and that the error is statistically um, significant. And so I will take this table and summarize it in text. <laughs> and so essentially what we have is we found that APCs were found to um, significantly undercount boardings by 5.4% and significantly overcount alightings by 6.9% at the system level on the rail vehicles. And so what this means is the estimations for NTD reporting of unlinked passenger trips and passenger miles of service are going to be biased. And so for passenger loads, which is uh, essentially cumulative ons divided, I'm sorry, minus cumulative offs, uh, gets me my passenger load, um, this is going to result in a systematic understatement by approximately 12%. And so essentially, uh, we have some problems. Um, with respect to the inside or outside doors, um, we're finding the inside doors are counting accurately and that the outside doors um, are biased and then they're not in the same direction with respect to boardings and the lightings. We see about a 7% undercount of boardings at outside doors, the doors on the corner, and a 11% uh, uh, overcount on the lightings um, on the outside doors. And then for passenger volumes, um, again, um, bias uh, not in a consistent direction. Um, it's uh, uh, APCs tend to undercount um, boardings at high volume doors and overcount alightings on low volume doors. And then we looked at the difference between uh, the airport max in relation to uh, the blue line, which is the only line we looked at at the time, and we find that the boarding and lighting counts are no different from other lines in the system. Um, APC error composition, essentially the total error um, in the counts is going to be a function of uh, systematic error plus random error. And we did a breakdown of the systematic and random error components, and essentially what we can see is um, the systematic error is much higher um, than the random error, and systematic error you can do something about, you can correct for it. And so argument is that it's measurable, We've measured it, so essentially now what do we do? Um, so if we correct, um, again, all we're going to have is random error, which is essentially the precision um, of the APC counts. And so what are the solutions? So we can apply correction factors to the raw counts. Okay. Another way to address um, the systematic error is better screening of suspect data. And so Peter Firth at um, the Transportation Research Board meeting, this is like bleeding edge presentation I'm giving you, um, <laughs> His presentation at this meeting last Monday um, essentially um, talked a lot about better screening um, of the data and essentially post-processing of the data once it's been collected. And there's things that could be done um, on that end. Um, a, a simple firmware upgrade could produce uh, more accurate counts. Um, uh, and then various mechanical issues. So again, we saw differences between uh, inside and outside um, door locations on where these sensors were located. And so the argument is, is like, if you can fix a mechanical issue, do it. And it's much better than going in after the fact and, pro and just applying a correction factor across the board. And so we compared what the correction factors would have been if we would have done that um, to uh, what we found from the uh, bus study that was undertaken one year earlier. And again, theory suggests that due to the wider door widths and the greater complexity uh, and uh, passengers boarding the lighting on light rail, we would expect that it to be greater, the amount of error, um, on the rail vehicles compared to the bus. And so we're finding that if we were to apply correction factors, that they would be approximately four times greater for boardings and seven times greater for lightings. Um, National Transit Database sampling considerations. Um, <laughs> 
This is an old document, 1978, uh, before, before uh, the Federal Transit Administration was known as the Urban Mass Transit Administration, and they put out a circular 2710.1A, uh, which essentially uh, informs transit agencies on what they need to do to uh, generate uh, estimates of passenger activity um, at a precision of plus or minus 10 percent at the 95 percent level of confidence. Um, essentially, this is a fairly low um, standard. Um, this is based on a trip-based sampling scheme. And so essentially, I need to adopt a particular sampling plan, which might involve sending people out every two days or every three days. And, and the idea is that I want a random sample. Uh, I want to select uh, bus trips in advance of sending ride checkers out in the field to collect the data. And so it requires um, a priori knowledge of which trip I need to get uh, field uh, ride checkers um, on. And so the issue with respect to shifting towards automatic passenger counts is essentially is the APCs are tied to vehicles um, and not individual trips. And so essentially a vehicle operates a, a block of trips. Um, and if we simply sample vehicles, we're going to violate the assumption of uh, independence because what we're after is trips, um, not blocks. And so Firth, Peter Firth in 1988, and then uh, Jim and Janet's study in 1991 as they de uh, developed some cluster-based sampling approaches um, to address this issue. And if I'm not mistaken, what this typically involves is we need to sample slightly more trains um, than the number of trips that we need to produce our estimates of passenger activity. Um, another issue is that there is limited APC deployment um, at most agencies. So I think most of them have about 10 percent coverage, which is where we were. Um, many, many years ago, um, and few have uh, the penetration rate that TriMet has um, today. Um, this is essentially a coordination problem. And so, again, for, um, for me to assign an APC-equipped vehicle to go out and collect data on a specific trip involves um, bringing in the garage managers and having sort of a proactive um, sampling plan um, to make sure that we collect information on the trips that we need to um, collect uh, boardings and alightings on. And so. Again, it's, it's something that if you don't have to do, it would be nice not to have to do it. Um, so a different approach. <laughs> Since we have extensive APC deployment at the agency, uh, myself, Jim Strathman, and uh, Steve Callis, uh, based on our 2003 bus study, uh, we developed a sampling method based on ex post sampling of archived APC data. And so that rather than sample trips beforehand and then go out and collect the data, why don't we just let the APC-equipped vehicles collect the data randomly, and then we're going to sample from the schedule, and then we're going to match the sampled trips with valid archive data. And so it's a completely different ballgame um, doing this after the fact. Um, we bring in Monte Carlo estimation. And so instead of having a, a, a simple random sample, which is a one-off sample, um, to drive estimates of passenger activity. So for 1993, um, NTD on rail, 437 uh, trips uh, were used to calculate the estimates of um, passenger activity. And so you get what you get. You get a mean, you get a standard deviation. It's just the, it just comes with random sampling. Um, so rather than taking a single random sample, um, why not take multiple random samples instead? And so the argument is, is if you have the data, use it. And so this is a perfect um, example of that. And so the value of the interest, uh, the value that we're going to be interested in is the grand mean of passenger activity variable over all of the samples. And I'll show you a chart at the end of the presentation that shows um, what that gives us. Um, and essentially what this is going to do is we're going to have greater precision in our estimates compared to a one-off sample. So uh, yeah, I'll get into it later. Um, again, the standard is pretty low uh, for NTD reporting, a precision goal of plus or minus 10 percent at the 95 level of confidence. Um, essentially, we wanted to determine the minimum number of trips that needed to be sampled in a given month um, to generate um, estimates of um, passenger activity for NTD reporting. And so we used um, the sample mean and the standard deviation value from the previous year. And essentially, we wanted the passenger, we wanted um, the mean and the standard deviation from the passenger activity variable with the greatest um, relative um, variation, as this would set sort of the minimum um, number of trips that we would need to sample um, for reporting. And we came out with an estimate. Um, we need 287 trips 
or a minimum of uh, 24 per month. So it's not many. And so to estimate patent activity, what essentially uh, we do is a random selection of sample trips from the population. And so the population is simply the published timetable. Um, and we do this by month. And then we undertake a data archive query. And this is uh, fairly innovative. Um, we essentially want to link a sample trip with a valid APC record. And so the goal is to match a very specific trip, the blue line trip 1320 on Thursday the 18th, which is a weekday, with the same trip on any given weekday with valid APC data in the same month. And so by doing that, we know that we might have missed um, one or two observations on any given uh, weekday or even week, um, but we're likely to find a valid observation at any point um, in the month. And so if we find it, we grab it. And so it's based on a uh, random sort, and so we just don't grab the first valid uh, APC observation that occurred um, during that month, we grab the first, uh, after it's randomly sorted, we grab the first one at the top of the list. And the same approach is used for uh, Saturday and Sunday service. And so if we don't find a direct match, so again, I want, if there is no trip 1320 for a weekday, uh, essentially what Steve's algorithm does is it finds the closest available trip in the sequence of trips. And so in the UMTA circular, um, they realized when they were writing it that um, you know, every now and then you're going to need to collect data on a particular bus trip and you're not going to be able to find it. You're, you're, for some, something's going to happen. A uh, vehicle's going to break down. You're going to have a missed pull out from the garage, something. And so you can, there's uh, procedures for, for dealing with missed trips. Um, so one of the things we're interested in is can the same repeated sampling approach uh, that was developed for bus be used for rail? And again, the real issue is that we have more limited uh, fleet penetration of uh, APCs on um, the rail vehicles. Um, this whole point's going to be mute, uh, moot, I'm sorry, when um, deployment reaches a, a sufficient level. So again, in was it, 2009, it's going to be 100%, and so this isn't largely um, going to be irrelevant. Uh, but what we did was uh, we wanted to know um, if we could find a direct match with a sample trip with a valid APC observation. So I call this the direct match test, uh, and it's based on a Monte Carlo experiment, which again is repeated random samples. Um, from the data, and so we took 200 independent samples of 50 trips each from the June 2004 schedule, and what we found is that we had an average match of 44 trips over all 200 replications, uh, which is an 88% um, match rate, and so that's pretty good. It's about 8% lower um, than the match rate that we received for bus, however, um, in June 2004 was when the yellow line um, was uh, opened, and so some of the APC-equipped um, trains were uh, shifted to the yellow line, so we felt like we could have done um, a little bit better. Um, Peter's recent report, um, Peter argues that if you're a transit property, if you have an APC penetration rate on the fleet, I'm sorry, fixed route, bu fixed route bus service of 3% and a coordinated sampling effort um, that you can get at least one observation per trip um, over the course of the year for 85% of the scheduled trips. And so Peter argues that this is sufficient um, for NTD reporting. Um, one of the questions at TRB, um, I can't remember exactly what the question was, but one of Peter's arguments is that transit properties essentially assume that what's presented in UMTA Circular 2710.1a is what you have to do. Um, but essentially all that's required is an approved sampling plan um, by FDA. So there's actually a lot of latitude in what agencies can do to uh, generate measures of passenger activity. And so UMTA Circular um, simply provides a guideline, but it's not set in stone that you have to do it this way. So it's much more flexible than that. Um, here's a frequency distribution of the uh, uh, match rate test. Um, again, we get a mean of about uh, 44 out of 50 hits, and um, Jim did the math, and roughly 75% um, of all the samples return 43 or more um, direct matches, and so we feel pretty good about this. Um, for internal monthly ridership reporting, um, as with most agencies, the requirements are a little bit more stringent than what's required for national transit database reporting, and the key difference is a greater precision of plus or minus 5%. And so uh, any student who's taken an introductory level uh, statistics course knows that uh, one of the easiest ways to increase the precision um, of an estimate is simply to increase the sample size. Um, 
So from this is based on manual data collection from TriMet's 2003 National Transit Database Report. Um, it involved 437 trips, and the 95% confidence interval for boardings per trip was uh, 70.4 passengers, plus or minus uh, 4.25. Uh, per trip, and the precision rate is 6%, which is well within the 10% um, as required for NTD reporting. Um, Jim did this little equation down here. Um, we wanted to know that if we would used a Monte Carlo sample, again, not a one-off sample, um, of 30 trips per month, and again, our minimum is 24, right? But what will 30 give us? Um, it will yield ridership estimates with a precision of plus or minus 4.4%, uh, which is well within the 5% stated limit. Um, for internal ridership reporting. Um, I just have a couple more slides. Um, this is an example of a Monte Carlo simulation. Um, I just received this data about 10 days ago from Steve, right, right before I went to Washington. Um, this is a frequency distribution of the number of boardings uh, that are estimated based on, uh, so again, we need 24 for minimum requirement for NTD reporting. Jim determined that 30 is sufficient for internal reporting. We use 50 to do the match rate test. And then here Steve is using 350, seeking a sample size of 350. And again, the argument is, is if you have the data, make use of it. And so he's sampling 350 trips from the schedule, and then we're matching um, with the archive data and finding a, a representative trip um, in the archive data, and we're doing this uh, 200 times. So we're doing 200 um, random samples, and essentially uh, the estimate of passenger activity for the Blue Line weekday, November 2004, the grand mean, which is the average mean over all of these, is 65,500. And so if we did a one-off sample, we'd, we'd wind up anywhere from a low of 61,500 passengers to a high of um, 69,200 passengers. So we feel pretty good about um, this estimate. Um, rail, uh, passenger activity on rail is typically estimated using a revenue-based model. Um, we were interested in um, comparing um, if you used uh, estimation technique uh, using um, sampling and uh, finding a match in the archive data uh, and the data that's generated by ACPs, APCs, um, comparing the counts generated by APCs with those um, from the revenue-based model. And essentially what we see here under percent difference is, is that the values between uh, revenue-based estimation and automatic passenger count-based uh, estimation are fairly close. So on the weekdays, they're within 6%. Um, there's a little bit more variability um, for Saturday or Sunday service, which is expected given that um, there's fewer trips operated. Um, talking with Steve, uh, we find that um, he is pretty pleased um, with how close they are. We can't say that one of these is um, one of these uh, methods is better than the other. So which is more accurate, APC or revenue based? We're uncertain, but just the fact that they're close, uh, we feel pretty good about transitioning from uh, revenue-based to uh, automatic passenger count-based um, ridership reporting. Um, in concluding, <laughs> what we find is the passenger counts derived from rail APCs um, are inaccurate uh, for both boardings and alightings uh, compared to bus APCs. The systematic errors associated with passenger counts from rails are substantially greater. Um, we believe the agency should attempt to identify the extent and the sources of systematic error in their passenger counts. And so one of the questions from the audience at the Transportation Research Board meeting was, how often should we undertake studies similar to the one um, I just presented? And my argument is, was uh, essentially any time that there is a change in something. And so if I'm running a particular type of rail vehicle, and two years down the road, I'm going to run a new model um, where the sensor locations change, um, the door width configurations are um, different, then it might make sense to go in um, and undertake another study. And then the next question I got from the audience was, isn't that expensive? <laughs> and it's like, yes, it, it costs a little bit of money, but then if I'm not mistaken, I believe this contract was um, to do the rail study was just under um, $10,000. 
which isn't bad. And so as I said that, Peter Firth read me and went, good plug. <laughs> because there's a lot of sort of disinformation um, out there in the transit industry with respect to um, this technology. Uh, another question that came up in the, um, the session in Washington was um, about the uh, quantity of data that is generated and isn't storage um, an issue and, and Peter Firth basically he's like everybody talks about that but it's, it's, it's never never an issue because the storage costs are cheap and so again it's like with more and better data uh, we can get a better picture of what's going on in the real world with respect to um, transit operations and so again there's multiple ways to address these errors um, I would argue that fix the mechanical problems first, <laughs> uh, only apply correction factors at the last minute. What Steve's doing, so that graph I showed of the, uh, for the blue line, uh, monthly passenger activity estimates, um, Steve's actually correcting those values uh, at the level of the individual trip. So we're overcounting boardings, we're undercounting lightings, correct them at the trip level, and then generate your estimates. And so he's comfortable doing that. Um, even with limited deployment, and again, we're only at 19% right now, and we've ascertained that you can make do with far less than TriMet's 19% right now, that both for NTD and internal monthly ridership reporting, um, APC data, uh, the use of it, um, is both feasible and desirable. Um, repeated sampling is a good thing if you have lots of data. Uh, it can help increase the precision of one's estimates. And then uh, there's actually been a memo um, sent to the National Science Foundation um, dealing with um, updating the UMTA circular 2710.1a um, to specifically address um, automated um, uh, passenger, estimating passenger activity using automated um, data. And as my plug uh, is that, you know, this too uh, hasn't been done yet, but it, but it still needs to uh, occur. That, um, Basically, if the feds undertake a very simple study and provide clear guidance to the agency, there's a lot of uncertainty out there right now about how to transition from manual methods to automated um, reporting and just a little bit of guidance and a, what, 10, 12-page paper is sufficient um, to provide a, a path for uh, agencies to follow. Um, Additional information, um, I can be reached and Jim and Steve at our respective email addresses. And then we put all our um, publications up on the uh, CUS website. And um, within about a month um, after the projects are completed. And so if anybody's interested in more detailed um, reports, this is like our uh, 14th or 15th project that PSU and TriMet um, have undertaken over the last uh, seven, seven years. Um, so there's a wealth of information out there, and then uh, APC-specific um, studies, I'd say there's at least half a dozen um, that involve analysis of data collected by uh, passenger counters. So I think that's it for me. Questions? Oh, don't forget to push the, the button, Bill. You mentioned earlier that the, you counted data <coughs> for the ons and offs for the uh, TriMet um, rails. Mm -hmm. And you were interested in the ones that didn't have any ons and offs. Did you come across any? And if we, so, you, you were interested in what, what did you do about it? We were only interested in, so an observation represents a door, essentially <laughs> a stop where a door opened and passenger activity occurred. So we were not interested in collecting including in our sample data where there were no passenger counts. Does that make sense? This is irrelevant. So, yes. You talked a lot about the various problems with data collection for the APCs. Is much work going into trying to find new types of technology that would be more accurate or only figuring out how to get better data out of the current setup that you have? Modern, well, a lot of it, a lot of accuracy is related to, uh, is going to be vendor specific. So whose technology is one going to use if they're a transit property? Um, the various vendors have certain degrees of um, openness <laughs> with respect. I mean, it's all going to uh, be determined in the logic and the firmware uh, with respect to the accuracy. 
um, of these various, and it could be sensor quality as well. So part of it is you get what you pay for, and if you uh, do your homework and uh, find out what other transit properties are doing and you specify um, you know, decent units, um, I think one will be okay. And then what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry. Okay. Ken. Uh, Tom, you indicated that uh, you have systematic uh, undercounting of boardings and an overcounting of alightings. Correct. Uh, is this a calibration issue that needs to be brought to the attention of the vendor and to reduce that systematic by or systematic error? Or how are you planning to address that? Um, my thinking is for the vendor to address that issue, say like in the firmware or in the design of say a new generation of sensors or something, um, what we find at TriMet with a systematic undercounting and overcounting of boardings and lightings respectively it might not be what's found at other agencies. So my guess is that it probably wouldn't um, be anything major uh, to the point that TriMet has done this study and therefore FYI you might look into I'm doing something about it. I think it would be more agency specific. So, but did that answer your question? Okay. Tom, I'm thinking of how much extra work uh, uh, the APC monitors would create for <clears throat> garage managers. How much extra work it would create for garage it's managers? A, so the real issue, Gary, is um, missed assignments. So I need to get APC vehicles out to sample these specific trips on a given day. And so if I'm a garage manager, I'm going to have to, you know, make sure that that happens. Well, there's three garages in TriMet system. Um, the potential to have something go wrong is high um, relative to, um, I don't want to say high, relative to it's just more work required to make sure everything's being done right as opposed to having, say, like a sufficient level of fleet penetration and just letting the vehicles run randomly. So with a sufficient level of fleet penetration, there's plenty, there's mountains of data um, that can be used in these passenger activity estimates. So I would say, given the choice and given the price of the units and them being so cheap, just put the units on and collect data as opposed to um, implementing uh, plans um, to, to sample correctly. So, yes? Uh, two questions. One, I wanted to know if there was a, sort of a camera-based head counting method for APC. And the second one regarding uh, variability at different stops with respect to uh, ride checkers. Um, did, it, did you find or did you check to see if the, the sensor systems were more accurate counting stops where there were, say, less than five boardings or lightings and were more inaccurate when, say, 15 or 20 people try to get on at the same time? Okay, I'll answer the second part first. What we found was your second part of your question relates to high volume and low volume doors. And we found that for high volume doors, the boardings, I believe, were undercounted. Let me double check. So for high volume doors, boardings were found to undercount by a statistically significant margin. And for low volume doors, a lightings were found to be overstated by a statistically significant margin. And then the first part of your question was, I should write these down. What was the first part? I'm sorry. Is there a camera-based head oh, count? Oh, yeah. Method? So you're thinking more like uh, license plate recognition or doing traffic counts via um, cameras. Why can't you do that for people? Um, None that I'm aware of, but to be honest with you, I haven't searched uh, for that kind of technology. The main two types of APC technology, well, I want to say there's probably three now. Um, the first one dealt with treadle mats, uh, which actually sensed uh, weight as people um, boarded and alighted um, vehicles, uh, weight and movement. And then uh, the bus is simply two infrared beams, and the direction that you break these beams determines uh, whether you're an on or an off. And then the modern systems are integrated with both paths of an active. So those were the biggies um, in the old days. And then, interestingly enough, um, the study we did on bus uh, with uh, you know, 
the accuracy evaluation using cameras, um, we found one other study that used that, and it was based on, I believe they looked at the counts on three trips <laughs> for a given day, and so their sample was like so, so small, um, and we sort of borrowed that idea and said, hey, let's do it for a bunch of trips all over the system. This seems like a good thing. So that's what you find, essentially. Like, why this matters is, or research like this matters, is you're going from a very data-limited, data-poor environment almost to, um, if you think about the AVL and TriMet system, it's almost like total information awareness. <laughs> you have data on every bus, uh, at every stop, in the system every single day. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And so it's just like, um, it's essentially, um, I would argue that um, it's a completely new era for uh, the collection and analysis and the types of um, internal reporting that you can do um, due to advanced sensor, uh, advanced sensor technology and making use of it. So, yes? Could the um, smart card technology uh, essentially, I guess, eliminate this and also provide like link trips as well as real time boardings and alightings? Okay. Um, the question related to smart card technology, um, I keep, <laughs> I mean, I feel privileged to be an analyst and having been at, you know, have such a close relationship with TriMet and to, um, to be around at this period of time where there is a, um, a large amount of high quality um, data. It provides numerous opportunities for um, research. Um, with the appearance of smart card technology, I keep jokingly telling everybody it's going to be the holy grail <laughs> um, for, for, anal for operations analysis, for planning analysis, because essentially I think the key piece of information that that's going to give, so if you think about it, it's like demand is realized at the stop level. Automatic vehicle location, TriMet's done it right, and it's at the level of the individual stop. The passenger counts are recorded at the level of the individual stop, and then once we get smart card technology, I'm going to know where each passenger got on, in the system and where they got off. And so the key difference it's going to provide is unlinked, I'm sorry, linked passenger trips. So I'll know if there's a transfer. I'll know if an individual only went, you know, 2.6 miles um, away from downtown during the AM peak. And I think having that data um, is just going to provide so many research opportunities um, in the future. And so judging by Again, a lot of transit agencies have a lot of these technologies, and few are doing the, the, the few are taking the lead to the extent that TriMet is. And so, I am confident that when TriMet um, starts, uh, well, both specifying um, the smart card fare information. Um, I'm sure that it will be integrated correctly. <laughs> it will be at the proper spatial level, um, and it'll be done right. I mean, just based on past assurance or past experience um, at that agency. So, there. Can you guys help answer that? There is discussion. Yeah. So the technology is typically, if you're a jackrabbit right out of the gate, you will pay a high price um, for this technology as opposed to waiting where the cost will drop. A well, do you know what APCs were when they first came out, cost-wise? To begin with? Was that expensive, like you were saying? Okay. All right. Yes, Arena. Well, I think I'm given the last the chance to ask the last question. Could you return, please, to the discussion of the Monte Carlo sim simulations and tell uh, tell a little bit how do you choose the appropriate frame? You know, you're comparing today with what period of time over what period of years, and whether there is an error in you know some trend over time. In, you know, Damon. Um, the question relates to Monte Carlo sampling and the issue of time. What I see is that the performance reports that are generated um, at TriMet are typically at a particular um, summary level. So trip by stop, route by trip, um, route by time of day. So it typically has a spatial and a temporal component. 
um, to the summary level. These performance that reports that come out can be monthly, quarterly, annually, and uh, essentially what I'm seeing is they're typically treated as um, snapshots in time they're cross-sectional and so there hasn't been a lot of work done in the agency I mean some of the measures will have a previous year's comparison there'll be one more variable to write that'll say this is what on-time performance on this route for this trip was in the previous year but it doesn't it doesn't bring in the the overtime component to the extent that it would if like one of the measures I'm interested in is consistency and so example is, you know, an operator can sign up for a different um, essentially work assignment every quarter based on seniority. And so the operator I had on my inbound trip this morning is not going to be the same operator probably next quarter. Okay, and I might have this morning a uh, operator that really cares about providing high quality service. It's gonna, my service is going to be largely on time. Um, next quarter, I could have the exact opposite. And so if I want the same trip every morning to work, I'm going to be very happy one quarter. I'm going to be not so happy the next. And so by bringing in the temporal component, we can get a measure of consistency um, over time. And so I would like to actually, and this is actually a, a grant application I wrote that got accepted, is to start looking at these performance reports, um, not as static uh, entities, but over time. And so I don't think that specifically addressed your question dealing with um, sample size, but... Um, that the argument is is um, I mean one of the things I'm I'm uncertain of is uh, how much to sample and so we saw that we need 24 we went to 50 uh, for one part and then we jumped up to 350 All right, can we go 400 500 with more deployment um, probably but what's the cutoff I have no idea but the the real argument is that you know to meet the stated uh, accuracy and precision requirements <laughs> we have more than enough data um, as as it exists right now so okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.